All right, don't forget to record. Yep. I'm starting and recording now. All right, live on Facebook. Okay, folks, hello there. Darlisa? Hello, for. hello, everyone, and welcome uh -huh. to our um, uh, real estate invest, real estate and commercial investing, how to do and get into um, investments the right way. Yes, you still can do it. We are extra excited today to bring you this opportunity. Um, I am partnered alongside two dynamic um, professionals. We have Victor Johnson, who is a real estate investor, and we have Marlon Steves, who is a commercial lender. And today, um, we just want to share with you guys some practical information that will help you to not only get into real estate investing, but to understand it fully and to know exactly what it is that you need in order to be successful in the game of real estate. So some of the objectives that we are going to cover today, um, participants of this session will learn how to position themselves for financing and investment property. We are also going to discuss various types of investment properties and we're gonna identify the proper documentation needed for funding approval. And the goal is for you to come away with a basic overview of how to operate and do um, a cash flowing deal. So I didn't introduce myself. My name is Darlisa Diltz and I am the managing director and owner of the North Texas Entrepreneur Education and Training Center. And what we do is we provide educational content to make sure that entrepreneurs that are wanting to be in the game and be successful in the game have what they need. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to our first speaker for today, Victor Johnson, who is going to begin to talk to you about the importance and the rules of real estate investing. Victor, it's on you. All right. Thank you so much, Darlisa. I appreciate it. This is a great uh, brainchild that you pulled together, bringing uh, us together with Marlon and yourself to uh, help share information with the community about how they can leverage real estate to start building wealth. And these are such, such weird times that, um, you know, we wanted to make sure we talked about real estate because it seems like there's two worlds happening right now. There's the world of people that are, you know, obviously struggling and trying to figure it all out and get their finances together, maybe trying to get new jobs, maybe figuring out their employment, uh, start a business or something. Then there's a world of people that really haven't been affected by uh, the COVID situation financially. Their jobs were still good. They, you know, they may have had to shift from in office to at home, but their income was stable. They already had savings, credit scores were decent. And we want to talk to those people because some of them are looking for real estate opportunities amid this time. You know, there's the people that are struggling and trying to, you know, keep balancing. And then there's those who will probably try to take advantage of great opportunities coming up in the real estate world. So that's what we're here to share today. Um, myself, um, real estate investing, I've been doing this for the last five years. And so let's dig into it. All right. All right, so what you're gonna learn from this presentation today, and again, I'm one half of the speakers for today. Um, I am a real estate investor, and so I'm gonna speak more to the real estate investing side. Marlon will get a chance to jump in and talk. He's a commercial banker, so he'll be able to speak to you about the lending side uh, for the real estate in the commercial space. So first of all, we're gonna to learn today the differences between residential real estate and commercial real estate. There is a big difference, especially if you are an investor, there's a completely different strategy and approach to investing if you're looking at residential versus commercial. Um, then there's also, we're gonna go over some basic numbers for you to remember when you are analyzing these deals. Uh, it's important that you approach real estate investing just like you would do any other investment. It's all numbers. You gotta remove a lot of the emotion out. It's gotta be straight numbers and systems in place to ensure that you get the returns that you're looking for. Uh, I'll have some recommendations for types of properties that you can start out with for your first deal, whether it's going to be uh, residential or commercial. 
and in benefit of both residential and commercial real estate investing. You know, my sweet spot is the residential side, but we've started an LLC this year that we're going to be doing uh, commercial investing. So I have a team that we've already put some things in place to start doing that. So I'll be able to share a lot of that insight and then the types of funding for your real estate investment. And then at the end of my presentation, I'll be a special offer to throw out there for folks that are ready to take action now. Okay, so why am I even qualified to be here today? I am Victor Vanico Johnson. Many of you know me out there in social media world. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. I like to share a lot of useful tips on credit, financial literacy, and of course, real estate investing. Uh, my background is I come from the collections world, so debt collection, so that's how I understand the credit reporting and the aspect of dealing with debt. I've written a book that tells how I even improved my personal finances and my credit was in the low 500s until I was in, until I was like 35 years old. I know I look like it now, but I'm in my mid 40s. So I actually was in my 30s before I figured out how to get out of the low 500 credit scores into the 700s and start building my real estate investing uh, portfolio. So I outlined that in the book. We've started 555 Equity, which is our real estate investing arm for single families. And in my first three years, I was able to follow some very uh, specific systems and, and rules. And we were able to acquire seven rental properties in our first three years investing. So, um, so let's dig into it. You know, for the respect of time, I'm putting everything on the screen here now for you. So um, on the residential side of real estate, it's very specific to being one to four unit properties. So we're talking about single family homes, maybe a home that you live in, a condo, townhouse, those are all considered you know, uh, uh, residential properties, a duplex. So if there's a unit on one side and another unit on the other side, that will be considered a residential property. Uh, even though you could be renting out one side and living in one side, they still consider that building a residential real estate transaction. Uh, triplex will be just like a duplex, except for there's three units. And then of course, a quadruplex are those units where there might be two at the bottom, two at the top, and there's four total units. And that is what falls under the, uh, the definition of a residential real estate property. On the commercial side, it's gonna be everything that's pretty much five units or more. So there are such things as five plexes and also of course, small apartment buildings. So this might be the sweet spot for people that are looking to get into the game, but um, also have uh, enough equity and leverage to, to jump into a bigger deal besides a residential transaction. So those will be a smaller apartments, maybe a, a eight unit, 12 unit, 20 unit is even considered kind of a small apartment building. And then of course, any retail space. I know a lot of people are looking at even storage spaces right now that would be uh, considered a commercial real estate transaction. So when you're calculating these deals, residential versus commercial, it is extremely, extremely important that you understand how you're approaching the transaction. And I wanna make sure I got my timer on, so I'm again, respectful of time. Um, so what you wanna make sure that you are looking at is, is this transaction falling as a residential? Is it a one to four? Or is this a commercial property that falls into that five plus uh, realm? So first thing, again, with a residential is very specific. And I do want to qualify this. I am not a licensed real estate agent. I am a real estate investor. So I do understand the numbers, but I am not a licensed real estate agent. Uh, I happen to have a business partner who is one and a office mate and a wife that is one. So my wife, Latasha Johnson, is a licensed real estate agent here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So if you're looking for a licensed realtor, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I can get you connected with her. But so on the residential side, the investor or the buyer is going to always have the value based on the sales comparables. So what are sales comparables? And you may hear that term as sales comps or comps. Well, the sales comps are basically they're going to take the property that you're looking at buying and they're going to compare it to a recently sold home in that same area that had the same exact location, size, condition, feature. So if your property that you're looking at buying is a three bedroom, two bath, two car garage, 2000 square foot property in this particular neighborhood, then the realtor or whomever you're dealing with on your team that has the expertise to pull the market analysis 
or even a seller's team, they're going to be looking at how they price that property based on what other properties in the area that are three bedroom, two bathroom, two car garage, 2000 square foot properties. So they're always going to base it on the comparable properties in that zone. Um, I think some of them will go for a mile, maybe up to three to five miles, but it will definitely be the same size, shape, structure, you know, condition of the property that they're looking at. On the commercial side, completely, completely different strategy. And this is why commercial properties typically are better investments. Almost every time it's gonna be a much better investment because it's gonna maximize your dollars. But here's how value is determined on a commercial property. Value is based on the cap rate or the capitalization rate. And I'll explain that. So your capitalization rate takes into factor two things, your net operating income. The net operating income is basically how much of your total income you can derive from that property. So we always know that there's rent. So if you got, let's say we're talking about an eight unit property and you got all eight units rented out and each unit pays rent every single month. Well, that is your income. But there are other ways that you could generate income on a commercial property. Perhaps you have a facility that has a laundry room where you are charging your tenants to wash their clothes. That is a, uh, a revenue generating uh, aspect that you could factor into your net operating income. You might also charge for uh, specific reserved parking spaces or covered parking, depending on where you are in the country. So that might be an added cost that you can factor in. Any revenue generated from that asset will be factored in as your income. Now, as far as your expenses go, it's going to take into factor your total cost to run that uh, particular asset. Debt service. Debt service is your note, how much you're paying to, to the bank or whoever financed that particular sale for you. So that is your note. That's your debt service. There will also be maintenance costs or rehab, you know, whatever you're doing to fix up the property and get it cleaned up. You may have a staff, maybe an office manager or someone. You should be factoring your management costs. If you are managing it yourself, there's a fee for that. You shouldn't be managing properties free of charge. That should be factored in. So once you've got your total revenue from that asset and your total expenses for that asset, you come up with a net operating income. You take that number and then you also need to know what the purchase price for that property was. Or some investors of commercial properties will prefer to go with the current market value. They should be similar, but they're not always the same. But when you're doing your capitalization rate, you will have to factor one of those, either the purchase property, the purchase price of the property or the current market. And so the equation is this, your capitalization rate equals the net operating income divided by the total cost of the property or the value of the property, whichever formula you and your team decide to go with. So let me break it down a little bit easier for you. So here's an example of calculating your capitalization rate, your cap rate. So if you have a building that is purchased for $1 million, and so that's our sale price, and it produces $100,000 in positive net operating income. So we just said that that net operating income is your amount left over after your fixed and variable costs are subtracted from your lease income or any other revenue coming in for that property during that one year, then you would take that net operating income, the 100,000, divide that into the purchase price, the $1 million, and that becomes 10%. So you have a capitalization rate in this example of 10%. So what does that really mean? So in layman's term, that means that one-tenth of this building's cost $100,000 of that $1 million will be paid for in the first year's net proceeds. That's a pretty good deal. You can have this big building that you're buying for $1 million in essence, based on this example, paid off, uh, the first 10% of it paid off in one year. So what would it mean if you had a 20% cap rate? Well, that means it's gonna take you 20 years to pay off using this formula. It would take you 20 years. Probably not the sweetest deal, right? And what if it's an 8% cap rate? Well, that means it's gonna take you eight years to pay off based on your net operating expense. 
So what investors of commercial properties have to determine is, am I generating enough revenue, net operating income from the property? Are my rents high enough? Am I chart, are my expenses too high? What do I need to do to get this number bigger? And more importantly, on the upfront, am I paying the right price for that building? So you have to factor these things in to make sure that your investment is a smart investment. All right, so hopefully that made sense on the commercial side. Obviously, reach out to me, here's my website, and I'll have my contact information uh, on the last slide as well. On the single family side or the residential side, uh, what I've used is a very, very basic formula. If I cannot generate $200 a month in cash flow, because again, we're dealing with comps now, so I got to look at what the market in that area is going to draw for that property to get rent. So is the average rent cost $1,200 for this house, this three bedroom, two bath, one, bed, uh, one car garage, two car garage? Okay. Well, then my principal, my interest, my taxes, and my insurance, which is my note, it might be a total of $800 that I'm paying for that property, but I'm collecting $1,200. So I've got $400 still there. But remember, on a couple slides ago, I said, make sure that you factored in your management cost. So if you're managing the property yourself or you're paying another entity to collect rent, to deal with maintenance tickets, then that should be factored in as well. So let's say that's $200 a month. So with the $800 for my principal, my interest, my taxes, and my insurance, plus the $200 for management costs, my all-in expense to run this single family residential property is $1,000. Well, if I'm collecting $1,200 in rent, then in this example, $200 a month, excuse me, is my, $200 a month is my actual uh, profit from that particular door, that individual door. So when I'm factoring whether or not this is a smart investment or not, I'm looking at the cash on cash return. And I never want it to be below 10%. Ideally, I'm looking at 12%. How do I get to that number? Well, my cash flow is $200 a month based on what we just talked about here, times 12 months in a year. So for the year, I would have a profit or cash flow of $2,400. Well, I divide that by the total cash that I took out of my pocket to buy that property. And let's just say I had to come up with $24,000. I did that to make the math easy. So $2,400 cash flow for the year into my 24,000 is a 10% number. Well, again, I really wanted to be in that 12% number. So I need to find a way to generate closer to $3,000 in cash flow for the year so that my numbers are closer to 12 and a half, 13% of uh, cash on cash return. And again, if this is going too fast, I only got 20 minutes, now I'm down about five, and I just want you to get a general idea of calculating your deals between a residential deal and a commercial deal. And then if the biggest one is the equity. I need to be able to buy this property for cheaper than those sales comps are saying that that property is worth. If the sales comps say that the best looking house in the neighborhood that looks like mine or the one I'm looking to buy is $100,000. I need to be able to buy this house for $75,000 because I know that there's some work that needs to be done on it, but I still need to be able to buy it at a purchase price that's about 25% less than what the best valued house is in that area. Because I gotta have some room to make that profit. I'm an investor. I'm not looking to buy that house to move into it as my forever home. I'm looking to turn that into a cash flowing income producing property. So again, I'm running short on time here, but I wanna give you some benefits to both residential versus commercial. Cash flow, I just showed you that. If you get enough of these bad boys, you can replace your current income with what you're making in your cash flow from your rental properties. You know, Definitely it's helped me, I'm a full-time entrepreneur. Principal pay down. So you have a tenant that's renting out this house and they're paying that principal interest tax and insurance that I just told you about. So they're paying for the expense of you to own that house. And you look back two, three, four, five years down the line and they've knocked out 20 to 30% of the principal balance on your note. That is a fabulous benefit. Equity, 
just told you, you mean being able to buy that house at a lower cost and increasing the value by putting some work into it, you force the value up. Appreciation. Real estate is one of the very few uh, things that you can invest in in our nation, in our world, that continues to show cash on cash returns, a higher appreciation rate. It, using this example nationally, and these numbers are a little dated. This was earlier this year that I pulled these, that, these numbers. But if you bought a house for $100,000 in July of 2019, nationally, the average is about 5% appreciation. So a year later, without doing very much work to it, just making sure you keep it, you push the value up 5%. Just nationally, that's the average. Obviously in different markets, it'll be less, but in some markets, it'll be greater. I may have some viewers here from Atlanta and in your market, you're seeing really closer to 7% return annually. I live in Dallas. Dallas is smoking hot for real estate. You gotta have more equity to bring to the table, more money to bring to the table, but if you can get in those deals and, and follow a system that, that's been laid out that is number driven, and you can get the return on your investment at 10% of appreciation. And then of course, there's always gonna be tax benefits, whether you're doing residential or commercial. I'm not a CPA, speak to your, uh, consult your tax professional for various codes that are available for real estate investors. On the commercial side, substantial current income and spendable cash, again, same formula as the, the residential, you got this person paying rent, but you have multiple doors and each door is cash flowing you pretty substantially based on what your net operating expenses are, your, your cap rate is. Excellent appreciation. You know, when you buy real estate, it's just gonna continue to appreciate unless you're in the wrong market, certain areas, especially now with COVID, you do need to be mindful of the markets. Are the jobs, um, gone away from that market now? Are people moving? Are people not able to continue to work and live and pay rent? Those are all factors that you have to think about as an investor. Accumulate significant equity through leverage. So leverage is being able to use other people's money to invest. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk to Mr. Marlin here in a second and find out how his entity uh, can leverage your deal and help you to get into that transaction without you coming up with 100% of the cash needed. Multiply that current cash flow through leverage. So again, using leverage, using other people's money, you come up with less out of pocket, but you're still benefiting from the multitude of that asset. And then of course the tax benefits. Um, there's, just, there's dozens of tax codes to benefit real estate owners um, and real estate professionals. Okay, so wrapping up again on the residential side, um, I would look at something that's under 1,500 square feet. The smaller the property, the smaller the expense to rehab that property. So those are things you want to think about. You know, I shy away from townhouses and condos because there's usually a homeowners association that eats into my cash flow. I don't like nothing that eats into my cash flow. So that is something you would have to factor into your numbers if you decided to go with that. But you might be able to get a bigger rent payment because typically in certain markets, you might be able to attract young executives that are making higher earnings. Duplexes, I love for beginners because you can live on one side, you can actually probably finance that transaction as your first home and maybe get in under FHA at three and a half percent down payment, but you still have it as an investment property because you're renting out the other side. Commercial properties, five plexes and five to 20 units are sweet because typically these are owned by you know, mom and pops like myself and my wife, you know, me, we may be owning this. It's easier to negotiate with me than negotiating with a big entity uh, that has to go through legal compliance and all these other factors. You can usually work out deals better. And a lot of times they're more willing to work out financing with you if you can't secure uh, the traditional lending. Commercial small spaces are good now, especially a lot of entrepreneurs out there like using co-working spaces. If you could find a building that you can put you can have social distancing responsibly and also uh, have it to where people are in a space where they can come in and, and meet with their clients. That might be a great investment from a commercial side. Storage spaces are great as well. Lastly, ways to fund your real estate investment. Obviously the number one way is conventional lending, having good credit, having the equity available to put as your down payment. Obviously Marlon will talk into the specifics of that here in a second. There are also lender brokers out there that 
uh, are independent. They just are tied to various lenders out there and they can help you with your specific situation, match you with the right lender. Creative financing, just told you if there's a mom and pop out there that is willing to work with you on the financing, a lot of times you can do that with those smaller commercial properties. And then cash, you got cash, cash is king. You can pretty much do things with that, but you don't have the leverage. You're not using other people's money, so the returns may not be as sweet. So my challenge to you is take action, do something. Don't sit on your money. Sitting money in the bank right now is losing you money. Uh, with the, you know, the appreciation, or excuse me, the rate of, you know, the cost of sitting money in there and leverage and all this stuff is just not, um, it's just not smart to just have it sitting there. It's only a one, maybe 3% at best return on money just sitting there. Um, I, I love real estate. I'm not a stockbroker. I have some IRA and some stocks, but real estate has proven to be a, a time proven uh, way to make money. Cash over ca cash on cash returns consistently and compounding interest. So if you're looking to accelerate your journey, you wanna try to find somebody who's done it, that has a system in place, We've got some offers out there. Everything right now, because we relaunched our brand, everything is at least 40% off. So if you're looking to get into real estate investing, we offer online courses, videos with support that we can help you get through that initial journey. We already know all of the mistakes you're typically gonna make because we did them. So we can help you get through those. And if credit is an issue for you, we also offer those programs. And then just in general, if you just wanna learn more about my journey and how I was able to get out of debt, attract more finances, and build a real estate portfolio. Download a free copy of my book. doesn't cost you anything. And we love for people to connect with us on YouTube. So that's it for me. I went over by a couple minutes, but we still had a good time. It's 1226 Central Standard Time. I want to hand the ball over to the money man. Uh, if you are looking to get your financing going, it is very important that you understand the criteria that it takes for you to uh, borrow other people's money. So with that said, I would like to introduce to you a commercial lender with InTouch Credit Union, Mr. Marlon Estes. Come on in, Marlon, if you're ready, sir. There we go. Thanks, Victor. That was powerful. So a lot of what you talked about will segue into what lenders like myself look for when you're looking to get into an investment property, whether it's going to be on the commercial side or the residential side. Uh, when we're looking at commercial real estate, some people exclude residential properties, but a large part of most investors portfolio will be on the, the residential side as well. So I do want to make uh, a few disclaimers. Uh, I'm a commercial uh, lender for InTouch Credit Union, which we are federally, federally insured by the NCUA. Also, we are equal uh, housing uh, opportunity lender, and we are not a, in a credit repair uh, business. So what are commercial properties? Commercial properties or um, uh, anything outside of the residential uh, real estate. So when we talk about commercial property, they're used for business activities. Uh, commercial property, we generally refer to that as buildings or houses that houses businesses. So any business that would be in a property would be considered a commercial property. And there are various types of uh, commercial properties and what are the differences between uh, those properties. So we have commercial investment real estate and we also have owner occupied real estate. So the differences in those two, a commercial investment real estate property would be when the owner does not occupy that space. So if you own a property and you lease that out to a tenant, that would be considered commercial investment property. And owner occupied would be considered if you own that property and you are occupying that space, like a doctor, a dentist, a CPA, any business that occupies that space where you're the actual uh, tenant of, of that space would be considered an owner occupied, uh, owner occupied property. So when we look at those various types of 
residential or commercial investment properties, we have a couple of things that we look at. So some are office properties, some are retail, some are industrial. We also look at uh, multifamily, we look at hotels, uh, and also special purpose properties. So you have that a large amount of properties that can be considered commercial investment property. Some of the most uh, successful properties that we generally see are retail properties. Now, a lot of lending institutions don't like to deal with retail investment properties because there's a lot of risk uh, involved with that. And so we're going to look at a lot of the different things that Victor talked about on ways that you can position yourself to a lender to get approved or even get your deal looked at. So you want to have a lot of the background things that Victor talked about as far as your cash flow and different things that you need to be knowledgeable about when presenting a deal to a lender. Or you can actually, like Victor talked about, getting with a broker. So brokers are someone that would actually have contacts like myself in their portfolio and they can shop your deal around to get a great rate. So also they can package that deal up. They can cash flow the deal for you. They understand how it all works, but guess what? They charge a fee to doing that. So generally brokers charge 1% of your loan amount to actually do a deal. So if you have a million dollar deal, I mean, they're gonna charge you $10,000 just to find you, a, find you a lender. So those are some of the things to be meaningful uh, that you definitely wanna uh, know about as well. So when we're looking at underwriting a deal, what do we look at? What will you need to present to a lender for them to look at your deal? So right out of the gate, we're going to need three years of personal tax returns. And if you have an existing entity that you're buying this property with, we're going to need three years of business tax returns. Now, that doesn't mean if you're new to the game, you can't actually get a loan. You actually can because generally your personal credit is what we're really looking at. Your business credit, that'll develop over time, but you have seasoned investment uh, real estate uh, professionals that don't have business credit. So we're definitely gonna look at that personal credit. We also are gonna look at your entire picture. So we'll look at a personal financial statement. So what debt do you have? What uh, investments do you have? What cash do you have? All of that type of stuff. What type of um, 401ks you have? We're going to look at the whole gambit of your personal uh, assets to see exactly who we're dealing with. We're also going to look to see if you have business debt. So if you have business debt, uh, we'll take a look at that. And if you don't, that's, that's not a big deal. So some of the doc documentation that we'll be looking at is your business entity, your IRS uh, information. So if you have all of that information, we'll take a look at uh, that as well. Things that you're going to need to position yourself to get approved uh, is I, I would consider leverage your partnerships. So some people look at, let me see if I can get a, a real estate loan by themselves. A lot of successful real estate uh, brokers and, and investments, what they do is they get a partnership. So they'll get somebody with money. They'll get somebody that has uh, experience uh, in, in the industry. So you'll get a, a group of people that have what you may not have. So one person may have uh, been, in the, been in the industry for 10 years, and then you'll have somebody else who may have capital. Uh, and so when you couple all of that together, you can package that deal a little bit better in the, in the lender's eyes. So next, we want to talk about um, what do we look at from a prospect? So you definitely want to have credit, capacity, cash flow, collateral, and then the strength of the guarantors. So when you look at what you're trying to purchase, we want to make sure that the, the bank or the credit union is positioned if we have to repossess a property that we have a strong position. So that's where you look at your down payment and, and what you're gonna actually come to the table with. So at minimum, what we look for is 20%. So just to get started off, we'll be looking at 
a 20% equity position in that property. And in many cases, it may be uh, 30%, 25%. So it's gonna vary based on the different properties that you're, you're actually looking at. And then also, obviously, can you pay it back, the capacity to pay it back? So that's where we look into your financials, what type of assets that you have, uh, can you actually make the 20% or 30% down payment to actually get into the property and things of that nature. And then again, your experience. How long have you been in the industry? Have you managed properties before? That way we know you have experience in, in the industry. You know, why are these things important to a lender? Because we definitely want to determine the risk that we're taking. Uh, and we're also going to look at your, your, your character and different things, your past debt making sure that you take care of your responsibilities in the eyes of, of the lender. So with, with all of that being said, you can get into it being new if you have leveraged your partners and, and, and you know, put together a good package to where we can uh, get your financing. So um, also experience is, is very important as well. So if you do have that experience, that'll help you out uh, along the lines uh, as, as well. So that's pretty much all I have. We wanna turn it back over to our Darlissa and then we can answer any questions that you guys may have. Well, thank you guys so much for that information that you shared with us. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I really took away a bunch of nuggets. Um, I personally am not at a stage where I am looking to invest in real estate at this particular moment. However, it is something that I foresee in the future. So I want to encourage all of our listeners, whether you are joining us actually on the Zoom call, whether you are streaming on one of our social sites, to please chime in, jump in, get those questions in there that you want to ask our presenters. And please make sure that you take advantage of these two gentlemen and their expertise. So Victor, he mentioned that he is providing um, complimentary ebook. Um, Victor, if you want to um, jump on and tell us a little bit more about your ebook and how participants can get access to that. And then we will go back to Marlon um, to talk about what InTouch can do. Right. So thank you so much, Darlisa, for that. And um, so with the book, Proven Pathways to Wealth and Happiness is the name of the book. I released it originally in December of 2018. And I did not have a plan to write a book at all. What was happening was I had um, in 2018, I, my wife and I had probably completed our fourth uh, single family rental property purchase. And so I think I posted something about it and, you know, God is good, you know, I've been able to close on another deal. And it just drew a lot of people to me like, hey, can you help me get in, into my real estate investing deal? So after doing some calls on Sundays with a group of people here and there, I realized that people were in different phases. Like you just mentioned, you're not quite ready to invest for whatever reason you are. There were other people on the calls that I had that were scared. Some didn't have the credit right. Some people didn't have the money. Some people just didn't even know where to start. And so I decided because I went through all of those obstacles to outline it in my book. And so the first being that I was living paycheck to paycheck with a low credit score, there were some very specific things that I did to, you know, change my whole mindset about that and that improved it. And then I started attracting more income. And then with that income, I started having different conversations and meeting different people. And those conversations introduced me to real estate investing. And so the book outlines that journey of uh, going from a check to check bad credit score to building and to basically completing my first rental property investment and all the beautiful things that happened around that to my life. Just so if anybody's out there on that fence that's still trying to figure out how do I overcome debt, maybe COVID knocked you and your family out financially and you're trying to figure out how do I bounce back, this is probably a great book for you to download. It's free. You know, um, again, it's just great actionable items that I applied to my own personal life to get where I'm at. And Victor, how can they get the book? Um, is there a link? Do you want them to email you? How do you want them to get access to the book? 
I am dropping it into the chat real quick here, and then I'll pull up real quickly the uh, screen where they can get the link, but it's uh, pretty much right there, offer.nicodonprojects.com. Um, and then the other links that I had in there are basically just links for anybody that's looking to get into credit, uh, getting their credit fixed up. So they can be a great presentable package for Marlin, or if you want to just jump right into real estate investing, you know, this is uh, the links for that. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that information. And so Marlon, we're going to come back over to you um, and just tell our participants and our listeners a little bit more about in touch. I know we were talking about the investment side today, but tell them a little bit more about in touch credit union and how you guys work with the community, you know, um, in whatever respect you want. Right. So uh, in touch credit union, I'm not sure if you guys know, I mean, we're located headquarters uh, here in Plano uh, in Collin County and have branches, you know, throughout the Dallas area, Las Vegas, Michigan area. Um, what I do is I'm a commercial lender. So I do investment real estate as well as uh, commercial real estate, but in touch as a whole is a full fledged credit union. So from your new accounts for kids, auto financing, uh, real estate financing, we do it all. So if you need any of those services, I can connect you with the, the proper place that you would need to go to. My contact information is, is in the chat, uh, but anything you can think of in touch credit, you can do it. We offer some of the lowest rates uh, around. So just give me a buzz, I'll get you connected and we'll get you taken care of. If you need any type of commercial lending questions, I can answer those questions for you as well. Even if you're not ready to get into the commercial real estate game, if you have any questions or wanna know what type of documentation or what you need to do to lead up to going into uh, commercial investing, I can help you along those lines. And we can even connect you with different people that are in the community that can help you uh, getting those plans and things like that together. Absolutely. So um, commenting on, you know, one of those organizations that can help um, definitely the North Texas Entrepreneur right. Education and Training Center. We would love to take a look at your financials, help you with, you know, some of the business planning, um, the concept. Um, Victor talked about some of those formulas that you may need to make sure that um, your numbers will match. Um, and then Marlon talked about the C's of credit, um, just kind of going through those processes and making sure that it's not just, you know, a fly by night situation, but helping you to prepare yourself for the conversation of uh, commercial investment. Um, gentlemen, one question that I do have for the both of you guys, can you guys in your own experience tell me or tell us um, some of the misconceptions about getting into commercial lending that people need to be aware of? I'll let you take that one, Marlon. Still on mute. Okay, great. So some of the misconceptions would be uh, to get into investment real estate, you, you have to have, you know, a, a lot of money. Um, and, and like I alluded to earlier, I would surround myself with a group of people uh, with, with, with like-minded uh, things, uh, but may not have what you have. So for instance, if you have capital, that's just one aspect to getting into it. You may have, you may need somebody like Darlisa to get you, get you, get everything packaged up, get you looking good. And then, you know, that can come over to me. So if, if you look at kind of how I get the majority of my business, probably 90% of my business, if not more, comes from broker relationships. So what that is, is the, the, the investor, they're going to the broker saying, hey, this is what I'm looking to do. This is what I'm looking to purchase. I need financing. So then they come to me with it all nice and pretty. Here's the you know, operating agreement. Here's what that looks like. Here's the property. Here's the value. Then they're going to do things like what Victor talked about, calculate the cap rate and, and different things of that nature. So when I get it, it looks great. 
once I get it, then we're looking at, okay, now let's get those documents that we need to get it to underwriting. So the misconception obviously is you have to have a whole lot of experience. You have to have a whole lot of money, though you're going to need that down payment, but it's always ways you can package it up. And then that's where our partners like Darlisa come in and they can kind of help you get all of that going and get that uh, looking nice before I get it. Absolutely. Vic, did you want to chime in? No, I concur. Um, that's, you know, so I just mentioned that I've, you know, purchased seven single family properties in that three year period of time. And then we kind of stalled, you know, it's like, okay, we sat here and we can do other deals, but I want to move into multifamily. So that's exactly what I did is partner with some other gentlemen that are financially solid credit is good. They're going to use my, my experience on the real estate investing side. And we're going to come together and put together a couple of multifamily deals. And so, uh, Marlon hit it on the head. I mean, that's exactly, you got to have collaborations, especially if you're jumping into big purchases. I mean, these, especially right now, lenders are, you know, they're scared. They don't know what's going to happen. If you're buying a commercial spot, they don't know if that property is going to be able to draw tenants or, or will the business in that area even be able to be open due to, you know, the, the COVID situation and all this. So I think you're right. Collaborations, bringing in people to have a specific expertise on, on your team. You know, um, I talk about teams a lot on, on my Create Your Future Self Live event on Mondays with Laquita. We talk about building that team. You got to have a rehab team. Who's your go-to rehab folks? Who's your go-to CPA? Who's your go-to legal team? You know, all of those pieces you need to start putting together to make it successful. And you do not have to fail um, because you don't have the money. You just got to bring the team together. That's it. So one question that I have on my side, on my feet, um, the question says, what do you think about the $1,000 property fixes that you hear about in some of the cities? Are those worth getting into the investment game with? So these are what type of properties? If I am, and you can please feel free to clarify, okay. um, Chantel, um, but from my understanding, like there are some cities that have like foreclosed homes or abandoned properties or something like that. And they just kind of want to get them off the books. And so they charge like a thousand dollars, but the work that you have to put into it is like thousands of dollars, but you can get a property for minimal dollars. Um, would that fit the same process that you guys are talking about? Um, so I'm going to kind of steer it both ways, kind of Marlon to you. Would you guys do rehab loans or rehab funding? Um, say they're able to acquire the property, but now they need funding to do the rehab. Would you guys do that? Is it the same process? So we do not do that. I mean, there is a way you can position yourself to do that but that's not going to be a way you want to get into the game, a way to start it. That's going to be for a savvy, you know, rehabber and things of that nature. So those programs, and though I'm not an expert in that, generally you'll find them in places like Dallas or, you know, New Orleans, the, the, not the suburban areas. So those are generally blighted houses and things like that, that you can get that they're trying to get off the books, but, in those programs, you do have to rehab them in a certain amount of time. And you, you're not going to be able to go to a financial institution um, to get that money. So if you have other investments, you may be able to do like a line of credit and have that line ready to go. So when you do acquire a property like that, you can use those funds to rehab that property. And again, that's where you talk about leveraging your partners. When you are or able to uncover deals like that, you kind of keep that to yourself. You uncover those deals, and then you go and leverage the guy that has the money that's not going to be able to uncover that deal. You bring that person in with you. He has the money. You have the mindset. You go and get your rehab team, and you all work together, and you can do those deals. But you probably are not going to be able to come to a financial institution to get that money to do that. Thank you for that explanation. And that does make sense. Um, so another question that I have for you gentlemen is what made you decide to get into the field that you are in right now? Uh, so for me, 
it was just the, the, the wish and desire to get out of my corporate life, you know, because I was running call centers. I was a director level, assistant director level. So I was getting, you know, 140, 150 grand a year, but the stress levels just got to me. You know, I, after 20 years of chasing for that, that top position in the companies and this and that, and going through multiple uh, corporate shutdowns and layoffs and company closures, it was enough, you know? And so for me, I was looking for ways that I could start generating passive income and still protect my retirement and start building a legacy for my kids and grandkids without the, the stresses of, man, I got to work 60 hours a week. I'm getting text messages on Sunday afternoons. I'm trying to ride down to the lake with the wife. I'm getting, boss, where is this report? Uh -uh, I'm done with that. So for me, it was about that freedom to have my time back. You know, maybe I don't always hit 150 grand a year with my payroll, but I got three companies, I got my properties, I'm comfortable, I manage my clock. And so that was my motivation. And, and for me, I've been in uh, banking for about 20 years, started off managing branches and things of that nature. And then once managing people, I mean, it's a difficult thing as Victor alluded to. So I just wanted to produce. So I became, I got into business banking and then off into commercial banking. And I mean, just really putting deals together and helping people uh, like yourselves that want to invest, realize their dream is kind of what drives me. And this year alone, I mean, me and my partner were at about close to $40 million and the credit union did three and a half million the year before. So, I mean, that's how much we, business we've done this year all wow. investment properties. That is amazing. That is a, a great triumph, especially during, you know, some of these trying times. So that does provide, you know, some hope and, you know, some hopefully inspiration to our guests that are listening. We do have a question from Ms. Sharita and it says, this one is to you, Vic. How many partners did you work with to purchase your seven properties? <laughs> So um, the first one I scraped, scratched and pawed to get, you know, a little bit of cash that I could to the table. My credit wasn't great. I think I was at like a 650 at the time. Um, and so kind of like what Marlon's saying, I was not able to, I wasn't a pretty package to go to a conventional lender at that time. So I found some other ways to get into that first deal. And I just hit a home run with it, to be honest with you, that first deal, 12 grand out of pocket that we scraped up. And then two years later with the cash flow that we made over the rent and the equity, we were able to increase that property. We bought it for 84,000, we sold it for 133,000 two years later. And so with all of that, you know, we turned 12 grand into 44,000. It was like, okay, cool, I can breathe. Let me take some money and let's do it a couple more times. Let's do it a couple more times and so once you figure out that first one and get over that first hump, you kind of learn some things, you figure out, you meet some people, you build your relationships. And so those first seven really were just hard work, grinding, saving, some sacrifices on some other things that, you know, we didn't decide to buy our $350,000 house. We bought a $200,000 house and use the rest of our money to start building our investments. And so now the next house will be that 300 if we want to but it was more about our decisions that we wanted for a bigger gain down the line. Thank you so much for that explanation. Another question that has come in is how would you all define hard money lenders? Is this something that, um, you know, those that have less than perfect credit should approach or should they just, you know, pause and get to a point where they can do it through legitimate means? Marlon, you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's, a, that's a tricky one. So I don't want to discredit anything. Hard money lenders will work for some people if you don't have those funds. But again, if you're out networking and doing different things like that, getting a team together and making sure you can add value to the deal, you may be able to bypass that. But hard money, it, it does work. Now, you might pay 11 12% for it, so you have to make sure that you're calculating all of those expenses and that you can actually make money by using the hard money lender. Now, just think, 11%, 11, 
you go to a bank, you're getting, you know, on a commercial side, you know, three, eight, five, four percent is great. But on a residential side, if it's not investment, I mean, it's a little bit lower, but we're talking investment. So you're going to pay a little bit more for that property, but you're going to pay two to three, sometimes four times the amount for hard money. And if you're looking to flip a property and not hold the property, it's going to be calculated in there. So you're going to need to know. And, and sometimes they're not charging you annual interest rates. It could be, I'm charging you 10, 11%. For 90 days. So if you really calculate that, I mean, you could be paying upwards of 30% on a deal if you have to hold it for six months. So being new and using hard money and not really understanding it at all, I would personally shy away from that. Uh, but if you're seasoned, you can use that hard money because you already know it's going to take me three months. It's going to take six months. They can calculate that in. You got your closing costs and all of that good stuff that you can calculate. Me personally, I would stay away from it. But if you have some experienced people in your, in your, on your team, you can probably uh, make money doing it. Awesome. Great information. I just want to reiterate to all of those that have joined us and that are watching live from the streams, please, please, please reach out to Victor and Marlon on, you know, what it means to get into this real estate game. Because as you heard, Marlon just mentioned, he and his partner have cleared over $40 million in property uh, investments, right? Um, and funds. So there is still the opportunity for you to do it and do it the proper way. If you still have uncertainties, if you still have questions, please reach out. Definitely check out Victor's book. He did put the link in the chat box um, and we'll have him put it on some of the live feeds as well so that you guys can get the upfront information um, that you need to make informed decisions. Um, one of the things that I will be sure to stress from my end is that you want to make sure that if this is something that you want to go into, that you go about it the right way. Um, you don't want to get into something just because it seems like it's the right thing to do at the time. You want to make sure that it is a solid decision, um, one that will generate additional revenue for you and not cause um, anguish or hardship. So as we come to a close, gentlemen, I'm going to ask that you guys give our participants one final send off message um, that they can stew on um, while thinking about getting into this real estate or the investment game? Uh, so excellent presentation and organization, Darlisa. Thank you so much for bringing us together for this. Um, you know, my only final nugget is this is just high level general information just to stimulate your thoughts. Um, I would highly encourage you to go out, dig deeper, research further, uh, reach out to, you know, me, to Marlon, whoever, um, to get more information, but do not take this as legal advice. It's not investing guidance. We're not telling you to definitely do anything. We're just sharing with you our experiences and some information that will help you get to the next level with your finances. Marlon, your closing remarks. Yep, I, I would concur. You know, I, I am a commercial lender. I represent Marlon. Uh, these were my thoughts, not really the thoughts of, you know, in touch credit union. It is just my 20 years plus of experience in banking on how to get these deals done and you can get them done in today's climate. So don't let COVID, don't let what's going on in the economy scare you away from your dreams, whatever they may be. So if you're, if you're definitely interested in real estate, contact one of us, we can get you in the right direction and you can get it done, let's win in 2020. All right. With that being said, we're going to close off with a winning attitude. Um, thank you guys so much again for partnering with us and to bring us this great information. For all of those that are listening, all of those that are joined in, if you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out to myself. You can connect with Victor or you can connect with Marlon and we'd be more than happy to share this information 
with you again. It will be found on YouTube as well as LinkedIn. So um, you have access to the information. Thank you guys so much. And we will see you all next time. Thank you, everyone.